I, I didn't want to be in the role of a, a place that I was not. So in terms of identification with the text. So I went looking for people who looked more like me, uh, who were potentially privileged allies, who had their awards and challenges, um, but we're also trying to be in solidarity in some kind of way. So that's what we'll do a little bit together, is to look at a few of those privileged allies that I, I found. And the first question that I'll ask you to look at is, do you think they actually are allies or not? Um, but in order to get there, I think the best thing to do is just to make sure we're on the same page in terms of even definitions. Um, so I'm going to offer a definition of allyship with the, with the usual caveats that come with any definition. So, you know, I, um, I pretty well, off, I often define ally as someone who's not part of an oppressed group that's striving to bring about social change for and with that oppressed group. So, someone who's not a part of the group who's striving to bring about social change for and with that group, rather than the option, which is being, continuing to be part of the oppression, right? But he, here's my caveat. My first one is, I actually don't think it's something we get to claim. So I try to, in the work that I'm doing, say, and particularly this relates to Indigenous solidarity, I'm striving to be an ally. That's what I try to say, I'm striving to be an ally. It's really uh, for you to ask the Indigenous rights circle that I work with whether or not I'm successful in that process. So I think that that's one of the uh, caveats around this notion of allyship. I think it's less an identity, something you are, and more a practice, something you do. Uh, so this sense of, you know, we have a static identity, I am an ally, I am now an ally, and, you know, but more that we engage in practices that model allyship and that show us, that show uh, ourselves, show others that we are striving to be an ally. So this notion of a practice, something you do that there's no one way, that there's this sense of contextual and relational, right? That what allyship looks in one context is different from another, and perhaps even different from other people. And, um, and in fact, your, your relationship to, to communities, there, there may be within a, a group of marginalized folks, certainly some people who would affirm your allyship, and others who would say you're not an ally, right? But that's the reality and complexity of what we live in. Um, and the last thing is that, and this is a particular issue for nice Canadian church folks, is that it sounds like you're helping, it sounds like altruism, but in my mind it's, it's, it's actually got more to do with unhooking uh, from an oppression that is soul destroying for you as well, and not just about helping other people, right, that you're, you're basically trying to extract yourself to a certain degree from, um, not your privilege, and I'll come back to that later, but in some sense you're extracting yourself from continuing to participate actively and prop up this oppression, uh, you know, with your, with your practices and with who you are. So that's my, I've just put that out there as definitions of allyship, just to kind of get us on, at least we'll use, we'll roughly be in the same hymn book regarding these things. And I will offer you four principles on allyship that come from uh, work by uh, Kelly Kramer and, and some others, and I, they res resonate for me. The first is that privilege cannot be rejected or disowned. Just because I am striving to be in solidarity with community does not put me in the same place. I think we know this, we've talked about this this weekend. Uh, but this is a temptation for lots of church folks that I go to. Um, you know, the reality is I strive to be in solidarity with Indigenous women, but my uh, experience as a white woman is dramatically different in terms of, for example, safety from violence. And that doesn't change just because of my intention for solidarity. It doesn't change that. So you can't, uh, si you can't simply reject or disown your privilege. Second, our task is to look for ways to simultaneously use and undermine our privilege. The reality is we do have it, how do we simultaneously use it and then work to undermine it? I would say one good example is in terms of voice. So sometimes I'm in a situation where someone says, it's easier if you say this, it's easier if you use your voice.
voice because you won't be perceived as a special interest or you know pushing your own or whatever. Um, you have more access. I need you to use your voice. But the reality is, over time, we that's not what we want, right? We don't want people speaking for other people. We want people's authentic voice to be heard and there to be space for that. So how do we use our voice, but at the same time be very aware that we're trying to work towards a situation where we're essentially undermining our own privilege. So at Kairos particularly, um, just as an example, we used to go to standing committees and present in front of, I don't know what a standing committee is here, but um, we used to present on behalf of communities. Now what we try to do is pry open the door to get access to that space and pay and facilitate and accompany communities to speak into that space. And that transition has taken some time and work, but that's where we're going. So we're using our privilege, but also trying to undermine it at the same time, and it's a complicated exercise. The third is uh, about intentional risk-taking or an ethic of risk. Now the reality is no marginalized community, we talked about this on the first evening, um, no uh, privileged community marginalized folks are in the same risk category at all. But I think that when we uh, strive to be an ally, we're prepared to put ourselves in some degree of, of risk and consequence. And we, we do that with intention. Um, and so that, that's kind of part of who we are, that's part of the possibility um, when you engage in, in allyship. And the fourth is, is really perhaps the most important thing of all, and that is that it's sustained over the long haul. Right? So, I think, uh, you know, participating momentarily in some action doesn't, uh, does not represent that striving to be an ally that requires the rebuilding of trust. And I tell you, in, in indigenous communities that I have the privilege of working with, that trust is, is really like a long time coming. <laughs> and even when you think you're there, you screw up and <laughs> in their graciousness, you know, they correct and we keep going and the trust is a hard time. And sometimes it means just being around for a long time before someone says, oh, you've been here for a while. <laughs> and then start to engage you. So that question of sustain in the long haul, even when, um, for example, you make a mistake and you're, you're corrected. So, so here's the question. What, what I would like us to do is to look at three three characters in the text, and to ask the question, are they allies? Could we understand them to be allies? And I'm going to invite you to use those four criteria as the question. So, you know, is there any evidence in the text that they actually know they have privilege? <laughs> is there any evidence that they're trying to use that privilege or undermine that privilege at the same time? Do we have a sense of their sustained nature of the struggle? Are they risk-taking? Those are the questions that I'm, I'm going to ask you to look at within three, three texts that we have. And again, this is about trying to build a bridge between the dangerous memory of freedom or liberation, as Joanne Baptist Metz talks about it, that we have in the text that can help us in the now, you know, both in our vision and in our solidarity. So we're trying to build a bridge and to see if there's any wisdom in that biblical witness that can help us in that, this context. Okay? You're with me so far? Sort of. Okay, so the three the three characters that I, I found, and I'd be fascinated to know some of the others that you that come to mind when you're having this conversation, is um, probably most traditionally talked about in this uh, view is the Pharaoh's daughter, so in the Exodus uh, story. I'm going to also offer you uh, Esther from the book of Esther. Obviously we can't read one chunk of the book of Esther, so it's going to have to be a synopsis and a kind of creative recreation in your own mind of the book of Esther and talking about her role. And the third one is Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea comes up in four, in all four Gospels, and so very briefly. And so it'll be interesting to see whether there's any difference between those Gospels in how, in how he, he is perceived. And uh, you will know that Chad Myers and I have had huge debates about Joseph Barron. <laughs> so I'm going to just give you, uh, uh, so I, I'm just thinking how many groups. I think we could be six groups, so doubling up, so three, uh, uh, the three characters, and eat, there will be two groups for each character, okay? Um, and is it okay if I just assign them? Yeah, you're going to live with whatever I give you. Five. So if you guys turn around and you're five together. Um, okay, so you five. 